Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kei Han. So uh, my talk is slightly different from the previous talk. So I was thinking that uh, should I give a talk which looks like more tutorial, or should I give a talk which is more about research? So I decided to have something in between. Uh, usually, when you make something in between, you make both sides unhappy. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, you don't have tomato or anything. So. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, using imaging as sort of a high dimensional intermediate phenotype or endophenotype, that's what it's called in community, to understand the underlying causes of the disease. So early on at the beginning of the talk, I hope that I can motivate you why uh, we care about this problem. And uh, later on, I'm going to introduce some of the notions that we have in genome-wide association for uh, uh, high dimensional uh, phenotype, and then at the end, uh, we'll talk about part of my research that are you know, in, in line with that uh, introduction that I gave. Um, so let's get us started. Here is the brain image of a patient with Alzheimer's disease over the course of 10 years. And this red area that I'm showing you is is a, is, a, is a structure in the brain called hippocampus. And it, you show that, you, you see that like as uh, the brain ages over the course of 10 years, this area shrinks. And uh, the, the, the green area, which is the, the fluid containing area, takes the space. Uh, all of us, as we age, we undergo uh, loss of the tissue. But this loss of the tissue uh, because of the, the disease is much more uh, pronounced. So thanks to imaging, um, now we can uh, predict the status of the Alzheimer's disease. We can replicate the, the, the doctor's diagnosis, which is based on the, the cognitive test quite well with imaging data. We can also localize the, the areas of the tissue that undergo so-called atrophy, which is this loss of the tissue, this gray matter that is uh, losing over time. So here I'm showing you brain of, uh, so basically, the, the, on the background, you see the area of the brain. Uh, on, so this is basically so this is basically a bunch of cuts. Like this is the same brain, but I'm showing you different cuts. And the color represents areas of the brain the, that l loses the tissue. And this is the same thing. Uh, this is the same brain, except that I'm using different slices to visualize this loss of the tissue. So. Also, we can predict the, the early onset of the Alzheimer's disease a few years before in, in a state called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. So now the question is that, well, if this kind of uh, information that we have uh, in the imaging data is, are so useful, why not using that as a phenotype instead of using a single number or, or which represents the status of the disease, no, normal control versus uh, Alzheimer's disease, why not using that as, as, a, as a phenotype? So that uh, resulted into uh, this idea uh, that uh, can we use imaging as sort of like intermediate phenotype. What do I mean by intermediate phenotypes? That at the end you want to study, uh, let's say, the Alzheimer's disease, but this intermediate information or richer representation of the status of that. It, it represents the heterogeneity of the disease. It will also represent different subtype of the disease. So why not using that as a, as a, as a, as a phenotype? So um, a little bit of uh, background about the disease. Uh, this is uh, showing the, the brain, the, the, the cortical thickness of the brain over uh, the course of years. And the blue represents the, the thickness uh, of, the, of the gray matter tissue. And this shows the longitudinal studies. Like basically, this patient undergoes the, there's a 10 years of scan. And you see that as uh, in a, it is animated gift, the, the brain loses the tissue. But not all of the areas of the, of the, of the brain undergo the same rate of the loss of the tissue. And uh, so this rate varies. And this is why you see different phenotypes uh, in an in 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 individual. For example, the reason that you see a um, uh, patient with Alzheimer's disease have a memory problem because th this loss of the tissue happens around those areas that are uh, related uh, to the memory. And also, there are a handful of genetic uh, variants that explain this. But this explanation are uh, different from different areas of the brain. <clears throat> 
So that will bring me to this um, uh, using this high dimensional image, uh, using imaging as so-called so intermediate phenotype. So today I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna talk about one side of this interaction, so which is basically we have the, the so this is in this cartoonish example I'm oversimplifying quite a bit, but here I'm assuming that the, the underlying cause is in the, in the genetics, and uh, you have so-called uh, endophenotype, intermediate phenotype that are measured by the imaging, and that results in a disease. And you want to propagate information back to the genetics. Of course, you can go the, to the other direction, namely that like sometimes you want to use some of the known genetic markers of the disease in order to understand the variation and anatomy that I'm not going to talk about it uh, today. So what are these uh, imaging biomarkers? So I thought that um, um, it's probably um, um, you don't, uh, it, it's better to be specific. So I'm going to uh, give a little bit of uh, examples of what do we actually extract from the images. And I'm going to focus on, on brain imaging, but you can, you can, you can, you can get an idea of what do I mean by that. So if you want to study, for example, aging, um, if you have a so-called uh, T1 image or a structural brain image, uh, we basically have a pre-processing pipeline that we apply different uh, processes on the image to make sure that all of the data are consistent. And um, because here we want to study uh, Alzheimer's disease and is mostly the effect of that is represented in a gray matter tissue, so we have to pre-process it in a way that we can uh, measure the, 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 the gray matter that are uh, on a brain. So gray matter areas on a brain are mostly on a cortex and some of the subcortical areas. In some of the, like you can think of it as a potato shaped uh, structure inside of the brain. So first we have to um, extract uh, a mesh that represents these cort cortical areas. So here um, we basically segment the brain into white matter and gray matter. We represent uh, the surface uh, structure of the brain. And then for each of these areas on this surface, we, have, we, we basically we produce a measurement that this measurement measures the, the amount of cortical thickness. So that is not the only measurement that you want to measure. So you may, for example, want to uh, uh, extract the, the, the curvature of this uh, thin shell over the brain, which is cortex. Why is it important? Because in some of the diseases, you see that brain loses their structure. So the information is not the th in the thickness of the cortex, but also in the shape of the structure that you see. For example, in some of the developmental disease, you see that some of this uh, variation is gone and the brain in some area looks flat. So the effective area of the brain that can contain these uh, gray matter tissues is very small. So we are interested in this cortical thickness. We also are interested in the shape of these uh, areas in the cortex. So, well, we get this local measurement from this, each of these areas that are represent cortex or some other measurements such as curvature of these uh, uh, areas, and then we can get the map. So this is not a cosmic background wave. So I'm showing you, I'm showing you the this cortical thickness on a brain, but because this cortex goes up and down, so in order to visualize it, we usually inflate the brain in order to open up all of these uh, soul size that are goes inside so that you can see that. So this is called inflated brain. It's not, no, nobody's brain is actually inflated, it's visual. So, uh, and then we go and visualize this cortical, this is as a, as a heat map. And this is similarly for curvature. It's just a measurement. You can think of it as a measurement over this uh, mesh. So it's a measurement per point, per vertex. Um, all right, so this is for cortical areas. Um, what about so-called uh, subcortical areas? So we have to segment the brain into structures. So, uh, and, uh, so a good measurement, a good summary information to, uh, to measure the loss of tissue in those areas are basically the volume of, of, of those. So what are the subcortical areas? So for the people who are working with the brain, amygdala, putamen, hippocampus, and so on and so forth, we, the, the, our 
uh, pre-processing pipeline goes and measures uh, uh, the volume of this over the entire population. Is the, the, the setup clear? Please feel free to stop me anytime. All right, so why do we care about this? So it's very important. So if you measure, for example, the cortical thickness as we age, um, the, the, the cortical, we, all of us lose tissues, but this rate of the, the loss of the tissue varies per individual. Also, if, you, if a person has, a, if there is a disease, this rate also varies. And also, this is uh, heritable. For example, if we perform genome-wide association, yes. So I'm, I'm just explaining the a classical uh, approach. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, I thought that I don't want to make it more like an imaging, uh, imaging talk. So here I'm, I'm explaining a classical pipeline that are used on a daily basis. So, uh, so, and so we know that why not uh, focusing on, on, on something that has a physical meaning? that cortical tissue and curvature are quite, have a physical meaning. But yes, people are using uh, different approaches to, to measure that. But then you, you might have a problem in terms of explanation, interpretation. OK, so it's also genetically driven. For example, this is the result of uh, meta-analysis uh, published by Hibar et al. back in 2017 that basically used the volume of hippocampus and performed genetic association. And this is the Manhattan plot <coughs> of that. Uh, and you'll see, we'll talk more about uh, method, like, methods, method like this and then how so this is just for one measurement. But uh, this, there is a, this measurement is genetically driven. So, and also, so I gave you an example in the context of Alzheimer's disease, but you can also extend it into other cases. For example, uh, this is a study done um, um, in collaboration with Pittsburgh and a few other places that they wanted to uh, derive the genetic markers that drives variation in the, in the facial features. For example, can we identify low size, low size that are resulting in uh, sharper nose or wider nose or different kinds of lips. So, um, so what I did in the, in the original phase of the study, they said that, okay, so let's do what you just said, the hand engineered features and uh, you know, do, do some measurement on a brain. So like, let's say the length of the, the nose and the distance between eyes and then perform simply GWAS with that. And they identify a few places. But then uh, later on they said that why should we just use hand engineer features? We can go and design, as, as you said, de novo features. Why not using genetic markers that based on the previous studies or based on the studies that we have done before, we know that are related to the, the, the facial development and go and interpret it on, on a face. So what they did was that they, they, they put, so uh, you probably have seen, in, uh, have seen it in the uh, Hollywood movies when they want to put uh, some avatars. So they put some sensors here and then you have a mesh over the surface. And uh, so you can view every subject as, as, as a mesh, uh, as a mesh, uh, Surface, and so then you can go back and visualize the effect of each of these uh, SNPs on a face by basically working on so called uh, on, a, on a space which is the you can think of it as a Fourier transformation but over a graph. So, um, so, so these are just few examples, this example goes beyond that. But what are the, um, what are the challenges? Um, so the, what is common across these domains? So I just gave you an example in Alzheimer's disease and um, um, the understanding the, the, the facial expression was that, uh, so th there are not one or two measurements. So these are usually unstructured phenotype. And uh, we, we work with a specific method to reduce it to a few dimensions, but easier way, it, it's better to think about Think about extending the, the notions that we have in genome word association to a high dimensional uh, uh, phenotype. Another important uh, thing is that 
Well, these are not, so sometimes these are not directly what you want to measure. If these are uh, intermediate measurement toward what you actually want to study. Example is the example that I gave at the beginning that you want to study Alzheimer's disease and brain is a representation of that. So it's something like intermediate level so that you want to model everything jointly. How can we do that jointly? How can we study uh, this uh, uh, data uh, jointly? So you have to combine multiple sources of the data together. So in this talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, um, the classical notion genome-wide association called uh, heritability, uh, talk about the extension of that into multidimensional uh, phenotype, um, and talk a little bit at the end about uh, association, although that mm, there are a uh, whole a lot of lit uh, literature on that, but I thought that like, I cannot cover all of, all of that. Other than that, without it, we won't get to talk about uh, any research. And then uh, I'll try to raise, uh, talk a little bit about the second issue, that how we can combine this intermediate information in the context of what you actually want to study. All right, so uh, a bit of tutorial. Hopefully, uh, uh, it's not uh, boring for you if, uh, if you are familiar with this. Um, so. So the first thing that we have to study is that, well, you, you have some measurement from the image. Is it heritable? Uh, I think that before going back and finding the, the, the genetic markers, that's the first question that we have to answer. Um, so here, I'm not, talk, uh, so I'm not talking about uh, broad sense her heritability in a sense that so in the broad sense, heritability, we are talking about all kinds of contribution of the genetics to the phenotype. We mostly talk about narrow sense heritability and cheap heritability. And so basically, we are talking about additive, linear additive effect of the, of the genotype to the phenotype. So, um, so why should we care about heritability? Well, like, I think a very obvious example of, of, of this is uh, height. So we know that the height of the individual are heritable if you have uh, of a tall uh, parents, the, the, the offspring uh, will, will be tall. And then if we measure and uh, the, are satisfied that the, the, uh, the phenotype or measurement is, is highly heritable, it's worth, we can go back and study the, the genetic marker associated to this. Um, so what is this uh, narrow sense uh, heritability? We are thinking about a very simplistic uh, model that the, the phenotype is a, uh, is a combination of the, 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 the effect of the genetics and the environment that you can think of the environment that anything that you either measure through confounders or something that you cannot measure. And we are also thinking, we are also focusing on additive effect, linear additive effect uh, of, the, uh, of the genotype that you have on a, on a chip. So I have to mention that so it's definitely uh, lower bounded by, by the broad sense heritability that you, you have through twin studies because um, while well, we have limitation in terms of what we can actually measure in the sleep data. And also we are talking about linear additive effects because, the, because of the sample size, it's just limited. What you can actually measure is, is limited. So, um, so just to put the, the, the set up the scene of, about what we are, uh, uh, what I am going to uh, uh, explain in the following slides. So, how does the uh, the heritability um, uh, defined? So, heritability is mostly def uh, is usually defined as a variance of the of the phenotype explained by the genotype divided by the, uh, the uh, variance of the, uh, of the phenotype or the trait. The way that it's usually computed by the mixed uh, linear effect that here, if you, Y is your phenotype, you have the effect of uh, fixed effect, which is your uh, confounders, and your, 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 your genotype, that basically your genotype is, is, is your random effect. So here, uh, so I'm, uh, your, your genotype, for example, if you want to study uh, 
uh, amounts of uh, the errors that a, a patient with um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease can, inhale, can exhale within one second, which is actually a measure of severity of a disease called COPD. You want to correct for things like uh, age and uh, gender of this person and amount of smoking that uh, he, he does uh, per year. And then when that is factored out, the random effect is the, the effect of the genetic. So what is random about it? We are assuming that um, um, we are assuming here that all the genes have very small effect, and that is, ra is a priori is distributed randomly. And what we are so with heritability, what you actually measure is the is the overall effect of all of those. So 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 far, I'm not talking about the the, the individual effect of the genes, but here is basically. Uh, polygenic assumption that like, all of these things has a small effect and, uh, and you want to combine all of them to, to explain, how, to, to basically answer this question that overall how much of these variants are explained by the genetics. So if, if I write the variance of the Y, um, uh, so the, the resulting would be so-called um, uh, so kinship matrix, which is basically, you can think of it as a linear kernel uh, of, the, of the genotype. And um, uh, that if two individuals are, uh, let's say, siblings are very close to each other, of course, we're talking about independent uh, individuals, but you can view it as a, as a relatedness of the individual. <laughs> and the second term is, is basically the effect of the noise or whatever that you cannot measure. And then at the end, your inference would be a so ratio of, of, the, of the variance explained by the genotype, sigma g, which is basically k is the number of SNPs. So k times the number of each of these SNPs uh, that you, you, you don't want to measure. You, all you, uh, you want to estimate is the ratio of the, of the variance. And this is basically, is this basically narrow, sense, narrow uh, sense heritability using uh, uh, SNP data. Well, one of the methods to estimate this, um, because um, at the end of the day, you only have two parameters, it's very natural to think that uh, we can use maximum likelihood estimation, but because you are interested in estimating the variance, maximum likelihood estimation would be biased. So instead of using maximum likelihood estimation, people use restricted maximum likelihood estimation. Another approach to do this is uh, so-called Heisman elson regression, which is the uh, method of moment. I'm going to go very briefly over these two. So what is uh, restricted, uh, what is REMO or restricted uh, uh, maximum likelihood estimation? So if you, remember, if, if you notice in, in a previous uh, example, um, if I X, X beta is my fixed effect, so this is just a fixed number. G u is my uh, uh, is distributed by the Gaussian, and if the, the, the sum of two Gaussian and Gaussian, I just like I just need to plug that in into my maximum likelihood estimation. But then, as I told you, because it it result in into bias estimation, what is done in in so-called Remel is that you just reform your data, and at the end your REML become maximum likelihood loss function plus extra regularizer, which is, is, is your new loss function. How, how people come up with that is that, well, by just, your beta is just parameter, and it, you have an esti estimator to estimate that. But although the true parameter beta is just fixed number, your, your estimator is, uh, has a distribution, and you just integrate that out. And, it result into a sum of your maximum likelihood plus a regularizer. That's all. So, so this is just one approach to estimate heritability. Another approach is moment matching. So if you remember in a previous example, I show, I show you the moment of the left side and the right side. Now, what I can do is that if I want to make this equality, I have these two parameters to estimate. So one simple idea would be just to view it as a, as a linear regression. So all you have here is that your linear kernel between y's. So if you have a matrix of a y and your kinship matrix, 
you can basically use the entries of this matrix and fit a linear model. So your intercept would be sigma e, and your slope would be sigma g, and that's your method of moment. So Hertzman Elsa regression is very old method. It's like I think it's developed in the 70s, but it still is being used because um, if you want to apply it for a very large number of the phenotype, it's very inexpensive. It's just a linear regression on one dimension, and you can, you're done with it. Any question? No. Okay, so this is for the, for the tutorial. So what is, what is that good for within the context of our background, uh, our application? So if you remember, we were interested in computing the heritability. What if, and like I showed you this uh, cortex map, that this cortex map, I, I mentioned that for, we, we derive this cortex of the brain, and each of these, uh, uh, each of these uh, vertexes here can have a value. This value can be measurement of the cortex within that region, can be curvature, or it can be anything else that you want. Um, is it possible that I can have a map of heritability that are distributed over the brain? So namely, I want to compute, I want to find a, a heat map of the heritable areas of the brain of the measurement from the brain, for example, cortical thickness. So, um, so here is an example. I want to have a method like this. So this is, again, an inflated brain. And it's showing, basically, the right hemisphere from this side and from this side, and the left hemisphere from this side and this side. And this is basically the same brain from this angle and from the top angle. So it's basically uh, the same thing. So the problem is that if you want to use maximum likelihood estimation and you have hundreds of thousands of these vertexes, it's very expensive. So you, if you want to, and then you just want to do it for one measurement, and you may have like 20, 30, 100 different measurements. So each of these, if you want to actually use Remel to estimate this, would be very expensive. So one idea is just basically using a variant uh, of, of the heisman elson regression that I explained earlier with some variation to make sure that the measurements is, uh, is, uh, is accurate. So here uh, I'm, I'm showing the result by uh, TNG et al. that they published uh, back in uh, 2015. At the end, their, the core of their method is heisman elson regression, but the way that they view the problem here is that, well, let's view this as a, as a hypothesis testing that we want to, the null hypothesis would be there is no genetic effect. So then we need to introduce a score that this, by the way, for the people who are familiar with this, is that it's just very similar to so-called um, uh, Hilberish with independent tests. But anyway, so this is a sc one score that in this score, K is the kinship matrix. Y is the phenotype in each of, each of these individual vertices. And P0 is projection matrix that remove the effect of the covariance. For example, you want to remove the effect of the age, gender, and, uh, and the confounders of, uh, of the population structure. So how does that work? It's basically um, you don't have the sigma 0 that is basically uh, the effect of the unmeasured uh, environmental uh, effect. So what they did was that the general idea is that the standard deviation of the heritability, you can prove with some approximation that is all, the standard deviation of heritability is only a function of the sample size. So, and then you can use the, uh, the idea that wall test and, and the score test in asymptotically are similar, and then massage the data, uh, m m so get the p-value of that null hypothesis, revert, revert it to t-test, and get the heritability back. So, and then they showed that the result that they have is very similar to Remel, that this is basically a software that people uh, use uh, uh, for, to estimate their restricted uh, uh, heritability using Remel. And they showed that the result is very similar, except that it's much faster. So when you want to use this kind of approach to explain the, the heat map for 
hundreds of thousands of the, of the, of the phenotype is much faster. However, the problem here is that we are still talking about unidimen unidimensional phenotype, although that you have a lot of this unidimensional phenotype for every individual vertex in the brain, you are still talking about unidimensional phenotype. So what if I want to study the whole structure of the brain? So I want to, I want to measure, let's say, that how the shape is heritable. So you can use one value to, to, to explain the shape. So in the computer uh, vision community, we have a lot of tools to, uh, to quantify measures. None of those are univalued, but still the, the, we have a lot of tools. For example, if, we, if, if, if I want to um, quantify, uh, if, I, if I want to quantify um, the, the, the shape structure of, let's say, this versus uh, something else, like, uh, let's say, these two shape. So one way to do that is to convert those to uh, three-dimensional uh, objects, or either, either as a volume or as a, as, a, as a mesh, and then apply uh, so-called so shape DNA. It has nothing to do with the actual DNA. But uh, so it's called shape DNA because you can, uh, you can basically use this as, as a, as a uh, fingerprint of every object. And all of the objects that looks like this have similar fin fingerprints. So it's, it's, it's basically, at the end of the day, it's a very good feature to identify shapes. And at the bottom of that is basically Laplace. Uh, uh, you can view it as, 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 a, as, a, uh, as a Fourier transformation over, over, the, over the vertex. So but these are high dimensional representation per brain that are scattered all over places. How can we answer this question that whether this is heritable or not? That is it worth to study it further? So what they uh, suggested um, in their paper was that, well, we can simply extend this notion of the univariate heritability to the multivariate heritability in a very straightforward way. Remember our uh, mixed effect model? So, in our mixed effect model, this was a vector of all of the measurements from the individual. This was the fixed effect and the random effect and effect of the noise. If you have a multivariate, it's going to be a matrix. And our random effect that was a vector of, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, so it's basically normal distribution with the sigma u, which is the effect of the SNPs, is going to be a wrong curve pro product of the kinship matrix with a matrix which is as big as your phenotype. If your high dimensional phenotype, let's say, is 25 dimension, it's going to be a matrix of 25 by 25 Ronker product with your kinship matrix. You don't actually need to compute this. It's just, this is just a form that helps us in, in, in computation. And then the notion of, and they, they come up with a notion of, uh, of heritability that doesn't have to be, it's not the only notion of heritability. You can come up with uh, your own, but the, the notion of heritability, which was the, uh, which ratio, which was the ratio of, uh, of the variance, become ratio of the trace of, of the genetic effect versus the phenotype. That's it. So I have to say, you don't have to use this trace. You, you can use any function of sigma a and sigma p as long as it's between 0 and 1. And as long as you can, uh, you, you, can ha uh, you can basically uh, come up with the with the with the closed form way that uh, um, uh, you can uh, compute the standard uh, error for the heritability. You are fine. So what they showed was that for this multi so and at the end the, the core of their method is Heisman Elson regression. So remember in the example that I gave you. So basically what they do is that again. They have a bunch of linear uh, regression, but instead of one linear regression, they have multiple linear, regre uh, multiple re re linear regression for every pairs of, of the phenotype that you multiply with each other. And it's very simple to compute. And you can basically compute this in a closed form. And what they showed was that, well, for some of, this, so, so some of the structures, for example, hippocampus is highly heritable while for other structure for such as lateral ventricle, which is the small uh, areas that contains fluid in, in the brain, is less heritable. 
And this is basically what I'm showing here is that sort of like a map of the heritability of the different structures of the brain. So you see that like the red area shows more uh, heritable and, uh, the, uh, and the, 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 as we go toward the blue is less heritable. All right, so, all right, so we show, so they show that not only you can talk about the simple measurements such as cortical thickness structure or, or vertex, but you can also talk about heritability of shape, which are more uh, complicated notions. But uh, the problem here is that you only talk about heritability of that in a, as if those are the phenotype that you are interested in. But what we are actually interested in is that we want to use this measurement in the context of a disease. So how we can jointly model all of them together. And um, so this is basically what we uh, worked on. Uh, and so basically what we, what we, the question that we want to answer is that we have the genotype that, uh, that through a complicated process results in change in anatomy. And this change in anatomy manifests itself in, in, into the phenotype. For example, if we see changes in areas that are responsible for, uh, for uh, location, the, 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 the patient may have problem uh, finding his way home. And so different areas in the brain have different uh, um, functions, and we want to see how these diseases are scattered all over the, uh, the place over the brain. So what are the data set that we have? So on the, on, the, on the genetic side, we have the SNP array data. And on the brain, on the brain side, we are, because we are studying the, on the Alzheimer's disease, we are focusing on a gray matter tissue. For the subcortical areas that, that are structures inside of the brain, we are measuring the volume of these structures. And, and for subcortical uh, areas on the cortex, we are computing the average of the distribution of the, of the cortex over the structures on the, on, on, on the cortex. So you can view the structure on the cortex as a subset of these ver vertices that are based on uh, anatomical, understand or anatomical understanding or have a specific function in the brain. Is the setup clear? OK. So of course, we, we care about the genetic. Uh, the, the, uh, so I don't need to tell you why we care about the location on the genetic side, but we also care about the location on imaging and on the brain side, because if we can explain which areas of the brain are affected by, sub, by, other, um, by, by the disease, we can go back and explain the phenotype that we see in the patient. So we care about the location on the genetic side, and we care about the, the location on the imaging side, uh, on, the, on the brain side, on the anatomical side. So the method that, so we started with our assumption and the, the basically we built a privacy graphical model that is, a, is a basically a way to model the conditional. That based on following assumption, the assumption here is that not all areas of the brain are affected by the disease, only a small, uh, only a subset of those are affected by the disease. Not all of the, uh, the, the effects on a brain that are even caused by the disease are necessarily genetically driven, because some part of that might be uh, the, the result of, uh, so, not, so basically not every region that are related to disease are genetically driven, and not every genetically driven variation on a brain are related to disease. So we want to incorporate everything and join, uh, jointly model it with the, with the, with the final phenotype. So conceptually, what we did was you can view it as, as, a, as, a, as a causal chain that goes from the genotype to the X, which is measurement that we have from the, the, the brain, which is the subcortical measurement and the cortical uh, measurements, and the Y, which is uh, the, diag the diagnosis. So, uh, so our model is basically you can view it as as a as a two layer to, uh, as as a two layer that each of each of these two layer have their own uh, uh, graphical model structure and I'm going to talk about it uh, briefly. So in the first layer, so in this cartoonish example, I'm building my graphical model. So so let's say that I have a brain that has four structures. So x1 through x4 are measurement that I have from these four structures. Let's say, for example, it can be cortical thickness from these regions. Uh, 
So because I don't know which of those are related to the disease, I'm going to introduce a, a latent variable, uh, BM, which is, you can view it as a mask that turns on and off and is unobserved latent that says that whether these regions are related to the disease or is not. So here I'm just showing you examples. So for example, here B2 is, if B2 is related, the, the variation of that areas will be unmasked. So the, the following layer can see the variation. And you can view it basically as, as, a, as a latent mask. So putting everything together up to layer one, so we are going to have a set of observed random variables, which here are represented with a gray. So it's your diagnosis, measurement from different regions. So in this cartoonish example, I just showed four. But in, in reality, we have hundreds. And we have set of um, latent random variables that represent these regions is related or not. And they all pass through a function that explains the, the final phenotype. So in, in this F, I'm hiding my model just to avoid the model that looks uh, gory. But you just think of it, you can think of it as, as, a, as a function that gets this decoding uh, of, of the brain region pass through a function to, to, to predict why. So your, our observed random variables are brain measurements, the diagnosis, a function that explain that prediction and uh, and and the and the, uh, and the and the brain mask. If this was the entire model, at the end of the day, it was just a sparse regression. So, but we haven't incorporated the genetics yet. So, what is the idea to incorporate the the, the genetics? So, if I uh, if you remember uh, at the beginning when I gave this example, um, I told you that um, when um, all of us undergo through uh, some loss of tissue because of the aging, but if the, if the Alzheimer's disease affects uh, subregions in the brain, it shifts the, the distribution of the cortical thickness in that region toward left because of the loss of the tissue. And here, the idea here is that, is it possible to explain that loss of the tissue by a subset of the genetic markers? So in this, again, cartoonish example, uh, I'm just showing you just, let's say, six markers, because otherwise I won't be able to draw it for you. So let's say that I have six genetic markers that are minor allele count in those, those locations. And I don't know which, for each region which of these genetic markers are affected. So I'm going to introduce another mask that this mask is, again, turning on and off to say that which genetic markers are, are related to the loss of the tissue in this location. So, so for example, in this example, the first one is unrelated, the second one is related, and they all pass through another function to explain this loss of the tissue. So putting everything together, I'm just showing you part of the graphical model. This is why you see these three dots, just, just to avoid the, the, the clutter. That, um, so this is part of the graphical model for X3. So we have a set of genetic markers that are observed. And a mass for these genetic markers that are unobserved that says that whether this genetic mark is related to the loss of the tissue in this location or not. And we also have a random variable that says that location is relevant or not. So if that location is relevant, it's going to contribute to the Y through the prediction. And if it is relevant, it's basically, if it is irrelevant, it's going to ignore the, the variation in the, in the genetic markers. So basically, what we have here is the key. So the, the intermediate layer tells us that if the, if the brain uh, location is relevant to the disease, I'm going to use genetic variants to explain it. If it is irrelevant, I'm going to ignore the genetic variants. That's basically yes. Can you? They're all directed, but you don't see the direction because uh, the, uh, it's just a small. Yes, please. Are you saying that similar genetic markers contribute to multiple Xs, or just all the oh. every X have the same set of? Genes? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. I'm assuming that every X has its own set of uh, mask, but at the end, I can bring them all together into one mask because I can I can integrate over B. But yes, in, in terms of modeling, I'm assuming that every genetic, every 
intermediate uh, marker has its own mask. Any other question? Snips? Yeah. No. So there is no there is no connection between uh, between G's, and there is no connection between B's. We have so uh, originally when we write the model. So uh, I'm I'm going to talk about the inference part in the following slide. We can incorporate into into. So when you said X, we use X to represent brain, mm -hmm. right? So our inference algorithm can accommodate that, but we didn't see, experimentally, we didn't see any gain in, uh, by incorporating that. Yes? So have you considered genetic connections between the genetics and disease? This model does not accommodate that. But it is po it's possible. But this model does not have it. OK. So. So again, to just to reiterate what I just said, you have the genotype data that are observed. You have the set of genetic masks that are specific for each uh, individual brain region. And our unobserved random variables are the function that is used to predict the diagnosis, function that explains the loss of the tissue in each brain location that are, like, if you have M brain region, you are going to have M of this function. You have a mass that says which regions are related, and you also have a mass per region that says which genetic variants are uh, associated with this. So the joint uh, uh, distribution is basically, although it looks, it might look a little bit gory, but at the end of the day, it's just like two layers of regression that are inside of each other. Each, each other. And there is a prior uh, layer that explain the prior over functions and the distribution of the mask, brain mask, and the genetic mask that lumps into the prior. And there are two terms that are diagnosis likelihood and the imaging <coughs> likelihood, if you write the joint distribution. So, and then what we are interested at the end of the day we are interested in computing the posterior. So what kind of, what, what is, what kind of posterior uh, we're interested in is at the end, we are interested in computing this posterior probability of this brain mass, this location that are related to the disease, disease and variation of those are genetically driven because if you remember this B, it sits in between. And we are interested in computing this genetic mask uh, that are pair region. So we are, at the end of the day, these are the queries that we have from this model. The posterior probability of this brain mask and this genetic mask. Do you, do you have any connection between the arrows there? So, uh, between connection the between G arrows? Axis and axis to what? Uh, G and X. So these are G are going to the X. So in other words, between those F functions, I guess. Uh, this F function? Do you impose anything? So this F function goes directly to X. Yeah, but but there is no F, multiple Fs don't, don't talk to each other. Because what I'm asking is, if you replace Ys and Xs, so you shift the layers, uh -huh. would the likelihood be roughly the same? So if I switch these to top, and so if I, if I do that, it's going to uh, address that actually uh, question that you just asked, that if, if you are assuming a direct connection between the genotype and the phenotype, mm -hmm. then you need an arrow from here to here and with the function. So that's, that's conceptually, that's what it means. Yeah. OK, so we are, in, we are interested in computing this, uh, these two posteriors. So I mean, of course, so that there we have a lot of uh, random uh, variables that are binary. And computing the exact uh, posterior is computationally impossible because just assume that if you have, let's say, 400,000 uh, genetic markers and, let's say, 100 uh, uh, brain regions, so, um, so 100,000 multiplied by, uh, by 400,000, 2 to the power of this, which is, I would say, is, is gigantic. So exact uh, computation would be impossible. So what we do is basically variational inference, except that our model has some interesting properties that even uh, allows uh, uh, variational inference uh, 
that, uh, uh, that they scale. So what is uh, important about this model is that if you basically stare long enough into this model, you realize that if we condition on, on, the, mask, uh, on, the, on the mask regions, the problem decomposes completely. So if I have M brain regions and I condition on, on the brain mask, so somebody tells me that these are the important uh, brain masks, I'm going to have M plus one independent problem. So this M plus one independent problem, M for brain region and one for diagnosis. So the idea here is that we just sample from the M brain regions and solve this problem independently. In fact, so this is, uh, uh, the, we got the idea from uh, the paper by, by, by David that uh, as long as you can, you can uh, compute the, the, the joint distribution, you can sample from this, you can also sample from uh, your form of uh, approximate posterior, you can do this. So to answer your question that what would happen if we connect X's to each other, in fact, you want to connect B's to each other, and as long as you can do this sampling, you can still do this. Whether you empirically get something out of it, that's a different question, but uh, you can do that with this inference approach. So what is the general idea? Remember that the graph that I showed you at the beginning, this loss of the tissue that we want to explain. At the end of the day, when you condition on Bs, you, you have to solve M independent we have to estimate forms that looks like this, which, by the way, is nothing but the base factor. The first term is null model that are easy to compute, just plug that in, the measurement. The second model is problematic because it's a marginal likelihood, it's the effect of the, uh, the, all of the measurement of the region M, assuming that that region is relevant, and integrating out that function. And because you're integrating out that function, computing this is hard. So the general idea to compute this is that although this likelihood, this marginal likelihood cannot be computed in a closed form, but you can find a lower bound to that uh, in very uh, efficient way. So at the end of the day, all we do here is that we compute this base factor for all of its brain region and store it and solve only this problem, which is much cheaper. This is hard because F, you let F. So, that, so it's basically this is a classical problem that, well, so what you want to compute is that you want to compute uh, the, the, the data. Uh, so you want to compute X given theta, but you have some latent random variable. So it basically entails integrating out BZ. And you just can't compute that integral. So for us, this integral would be sum over all of the A's, all of the states of the A's, and all of the states of the B's that are exponential. So you see this B has the effect of all of the genetic markers. So you remember that we have all of these genetic markers. All has to integrate it out. And the effect of those, whatever the parameters that we have inside of these that I didn't talk about it, we will also integrate that out too. But at the end of the day, this is just a marginal likelihood. And you can approximate marginal likelihood with so-called evidence lower bound or elbow. OK, so, so at the end, what we get is a bunch of, uh, so, so what, OK, so let's assume that we did this. What do we get at the end of it? We are going to get. Posterior probability of this brain mask, so what I'm, I'm going to show you uh, the, the inflated brain, except that the color map would be value of this posterior, marginal posterior uh, marginals of this brain region. So if it's very hot, means that it's, 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 it's very likely that that region is relevant to the disease and variation of those is genetically driven. If it is less hot, means that it's not. But at the end, it's just a posterior probability. It's a way to visualize it. What about on the genetic side? So how does this posterior energetic side looks like? So I'm going to show you uh, posterior inclusion probability in the form of uh, Manhattan plot. So I have to say that the y-axis is different than Manhattan plot because in a, in a Manhattan plot, the y-axis is the log of the p-value uh, p of the null hypothesis, while here the, the, the is, is, is a posterior probability. 
And also, should be a line here. I don't know why you don't see it. But so it's between 0 and 1, so PIP, posterior inclusion probability. The 1 is at the top, yes. There should be a line here at 0, as 0 0.5, that is half. Anything that passes half, yeah. Anyway, and that this shade of the grays represent the change of the chromosome. The genome-wide. So we are competing for around 400,000 SNPs. So I wouldn't, if you talk about millions, then that's too expensive. Well, you can compute about around 400,000. So, OK, that's a really good question. For this specific example, because the imaging data is very expensive and uh, it's like it's around four, uh, 600 imaging with the genetic data. So what we basically all we can hope is that what we can get with this small sample size. But the general idea can be extend, uh, can be applied when you have a larger sample size and you have different kind of intermediate phenotype. So here we are using uh, an, an so-called atlas that, uh, so basically atlas you can view it as, a, as an annotation over the brain, over the stru brain structure, that has around 100 uh, brain regions. Exact number is not 100, but it's like 102 or something. So the end of is the of That's right. Yeah, so that was, that was, well, yeah, you can, you can use the shape, you can use the, sh you can use the regional, yes, so, so the regional, so here we are using very simple measurement of one region, which is the average of the cortical thickness within that region, but you can use a multi-dimensional, it doesn't really matter. So all of the stories that I told you at the beginning to convince you that it is heritable. <laughs> All right. Um, and this point five is just magic. Uh, so this is PIP is between zero and one. We just I set the threshold. Or you could, I mean, you could just shuffle the one. Yeah. And that could give you like some baseline. Or shuffle the. Right. Answers. Yes. Yeah. So that's a really good point that I don't know any quantitative way to go from posterior probability to p value. Well, if you are interested in p value for that. Sure. Well, well, I'm just saying that like, you can test your robustness by just doing some permutation by right. along the y's. That's right, yeah. You have two levels, so it's kind of more complicated how you yeah. do the permutation, but you can imagine something. Yeah, you can do that. Yes? If you run a direct association analysis of the SNPs in this region with the end of phenotype, did you see a... I'm going to show you in the next slide. <laughs> so, so basically, I was telling you what I'm going to show you and then here you go. So here is the, the, the color map uh, of this inflated brain region. This is left hemisphere. This is this side of the brain from this angle and this angle because I can cut the left hemisphere. You can see it from this angle from, from inside. And this is right, angle, right hemisphere from this side and this side. The color, five minutes. OK, I'll, I'll be done. So the color represents whether that region is important or not. And all of these brain regions that are no scientists, collaborators, believe that they are related uh, to the Alzheimer's disease show up. So far, uh, this is consistent with what we knew. But what is even more interesting is that we can go and find the, the regional association of each of these brain regions. So to go back to your question, what would happen, for example, so I show you one of these regions at the beginning, which was hippocampus. If I use that and fit that to generalized real MR and get the p-values and compute it to my PIP on the right, so on the right-hand side, I'm, sh I'm showing you the log p-value, but I'm using the, 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 the volume of that region. And so this is log p-value, and, and, and that is PIP. So, so far, the only genetic variant that passes a significant level is, is APOE, and the results are the same. So you didn't, I didn't get any new discoveries. So that part, although that they said that they both show the same result, although they are not one-to-one -one correspondence, didn't discover new thing. On the right but, side, you're looking at genetic versus Y? Or do you have the so in, in this one, I'm using the volume of the hippocampus and directly doing association, as you just mentioned. Okay. 
so x xm to g with association with just glm but for another region that our model also showed that is important it's called entorenal cortex if we like perform the genetic association on, we only see the, the suggestive association with the genetic variant called apoe which is probably the most important genetic variant for the Alzheimer's disease, while our model picks APOE and a few other uh, genetic variants. And we can do that for all of these brain regions. So what we did was that, so we collected all of these and performed uh, enrichment tests. And we find enrichment in two pathways. One of them was the three signaling pathways that um, this is known because it's related to so-called beta amyloid plugs that are a hallmark of the Alzheimer disease, and it's known that it's related to disease. But we also saw enrichment in so-called so alpha-4, beta-1 inter-signaling pathways that are not directly related, uh, to, that are not uh, previously reported, but is very important uh, in uh, other diseases such as multiple sclerosis. It's, it's, it's basically mediate the broad brain barrier for the immune cells. And this is, in some sense, uh, uh, consistent with the recent finding that maybe Alzheimer's disease is an immune disease and it mediates something else such as br blood brain barrier and that uh, um, uh, it's consistent with the recent fi finding. So what would happen if I combine all of them together? So I can use the posterior probability of these brain regions, weight this association of the regions and sum them up together. So what I get is that the results would be very similar to performing genetic association tests directly between G between G and Y. So this is G and Y, and only APOE shows up. If I average them all together, only APOE survives. But if I go and decorrelate the effect of that pair regions, I can get more genetic variants. Right, so you could also investigate this colocalization type things where you just overlap G and X with G and Y without imposing this, this uh, causal model that you're imposing, which is yeah. G goes to X. Yeah. I guess this sample size is too small to answer that question. <laughs> yes? So how is this connection Can you what? So is it related to partial correlation? Partial correlation? Yeah. Um, I don't see a connection between this and partial correlation. Can you elaborate? Partial correlation because conditional on, so the interaction matters, you're estimating from Y to the Genetic position mm -hmm. is uh, actually conditional on the image regions. Mm -hmm. So we, essence, so I don't see the connection between partial correlation, but we had a variant of this model that if you uh, write down the updates of the of the of the intermediate layers and assume that is a parameter and just one of the update parameters, one of the updates, one of the updates look like the update of uh, sparse low rank regression, which is re uh, related uh, to what you are saying. But this is one of the updates. And that model is slightly different than that, but you can see that in our, uh, in our method. We have like maybe like a paragraph or two on that, that like one of the updates sounds, that, sounds like that as if you are solving sparse uh, reduced rank regression in the middle. But I don't see the, the direct connection to what you just said. Maybe we can talk after that. Sure, we can talk. Okay, so summarize. So, so this is just one direction going from uh, integrating back and bringing everything to the genetic side. What if you want to use genetic markers to come up with better imaging biomarkers? So this is the reverse direction. And we are working on, on that in the context of a uh, much larger scale study uh, uh, for a different disease, of course, uh, but a, a disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And we are using basically set of genetic markers to see whether we can subtype a pattern that you see in the, in the image. And we are using a deep learning type of approach to do that. And um, another interesting appro uh, approach would be extending the, such model for to, to have multiple la layer of measurements. For example, in a, in, a, in a brain tumor that you have direct access to the tissue. For example, glioblastoma that sometimes you have to open the, the brain and extract the tissue and you want to study the rec recurrence of the tumor. 
And another interesting direction would be basically doing things on a scale. Now the, the, the UK Biobank has, has released the data set uh, and part of the data set also has imaging data. You can basically deploy this beyond 400 to thousands. All right, so I'd like to thank my collaborators and you know, 